Hello, everyone. I am Juliet Gordon Lowe, the founder of Girl Scouts, and I am so pleased to have you visit me here today in front of my home in Savannah, Georgia. It is a beautiful day here in the year 1920, and I know that you know quite a bit about me because I bet that many of you visiting me here today are scouts yourselves. <laughs> I can see many scouts here already, and my, I am so proud of the way this organization has grown over the years. You make me proud. Now, I know that you've probably heard a lot about me. I'm sure you know that I am from Savannah, Georgia. But I wonder, does anyone know when my birthday is? Now, I have Mr. Glenn here as my assistant. And Mr. Glenn, if you can let me know what our Girl Scouts are saying, what their guesses are. Do you know when I was born? When was my birthday? It was on a particular holiday. Was it Valentine's Day? Christmas Day? <laughs> what do you think? Mr. Glenn, do we have any we guesses? Don't, we don't have any guesses yet. Well, I'll go ahead and tell you that my birthday is on Halloween of all days. This was not a very uh, happy surprise for my mother, I can tell you that. She said that I chose to make my appearance on Halloween night. <laughs> and I suppose that matches my exuberant and eccentric personality. I've been told that I am quite a uh, crazy Daisy. <laughs> now that is my nickname, Daisy. And I got that nickname from my uncle. When he heard that I was born, he said, well, I bet she'll be a Daisy. And my mother and father would tell you that I certainly was, but they always insist on calling me Crazy Daisy. Now that's because I insisted that everyone join me in all of my fascinations as a child and as an adult. I loved to write plays, to write my own poetry, to go outdoors and enjoy nature, but I especially enjoyed art. Now do we have any artists here today? Any crafters, perhaps? I personally loved painting in particular. Do we have any painters here today? Now the type of painting that I thoroughly enjoyed would be landscape because I also got to appreciate nature. I could go outside, see a beautiful scene, and then with the skills I had learned from painting, I was able to capture that beauty and appreciate it forever. Now I also liked to doodle or make my own little cartoons for fun. Other art that I enjoyed was sculpture. I loved creating sculptures. I even created a small little miniature sculpture of my dear niece, who is also named Daisy. But all of those fascinations, I never knew that they would lead me to having an organization where I could share all of my wonderful skills and activities that I had learned through girl guiding in England. Now, you may not be familiar with girl guiding. That was what brought me to the Girl Scouts. I was in England, and I met a man named Sir Robert baden Pohl. Now, do you know who Sir Robert baden Pohl is? He's a very famous man. Any guesses? Oh, someone says that he began the Boy Scouts. Indeed, very good. <laughs> That's correct. Robert baden Pohl created the Boy Scouts. Now, this was in 1911 when I first met him in England. We happened to be at a banquet together. And when I heard about the Boy Scouts, I was fascinated. But you know, what really caught my attention was to learn that over 6,000 girls tried to sign up as Boy Scouts, either using their initials or their brother's names. So girls clearly wanted to be doing similar activities and become Scouts themselves. So, Sir Robert baden Pohl's sister Agnes started an organization called Girl Guides in England. And when I heard about that, I just knew that I had to find out more. So, when I was in England, and I had a home in Scotland as well, I led troops of girl guides there. And when I loved this idea and learned all about it, I took the idea to America and started Girl Guides in America in 1912. 
soon after, that became Girl Scouts. Now that is a very, very brief history of how Girl Scouts began. And I would love for this conversation today to be based on what you want to know. So if we have any questions, Mr. Glenn, from our audience today, I would be happy to answer your questions. Sure. The first question from Jennifer Lynn is uh, she wants to know if you've had any pets. Oh, yes. Jennifer wants to know if I had any pets. Well, I am an animal lover, and I love dogs and birds in particular. Now, the dogs I had when I grew up, they were in particular, I love the breed, the Pekingese. Does, do any of you have the Pekingese breed as a pet? <laughs> I suppose my family's dog was probably my favorite, the one I have the most memories with, and that dog's name was Chi Chi. <laughs> now, I also had many birds, but the one that comes to mind is my macaw, a beautiful blue macaw whose name was Blue Boy. <laughs> so it's true, I have been an animal lover my entire life. I've had many dogs and many birds. And I'm sure that I picked up a few extra animals along the way. I, am, I, I believe that I could have been an excellent zookeeper at one point. <laughs> but Girl Scouts has me plenty busy. But yes, an excellent question. Thank you for asking that, Jennifer. Uh, Tegan, who is a Girl Scout now, wants to know uh, what you did during the first Girl Scout meeting. Ah, the f Tegan wants to know what we did through the first Girl Scout meeting. Well, you can imagine, it was a very exciting day. We first held our uh, first Girl Scout meeting on March 12th of 1912. And of course, this was Girl Guides still. We weren't the Scouts yet, but it was essentially our first day of this uh, brave new endeavor. So, of course, I had done my homework with the Girl Guides. I knew how I wanted our meetings to go. And the first thing we did was, of course, to get to know one another because friendship and building that relationship is very important but we also learned the Girl Scout laws and the Girl Scout promise, which I am sure many of you are familiar with. But for those who are not familiar, you can always take a look at our handy handbook, How Girls Can Help Their Country. Now, if I take a look in here, there's always going to be instructions on everything you need to do as a troop leader or a Girl Scout in our Girl Scout manuals. So, for instance, on the very first meeting, we do go over the laws of the Scouts and the Girl Scout promise. And of course, we all know the Girl Scout promise. Shall we say it together? Everybody's hands up, please. One, to do your duty to God and to your country. Two, to help other people at all times. And three, to obey the laws of the Scouts. Very good. And I'm sure many of you have already made that promise. But the laws of the Scouts, what are they? Well, one is a girl must always be loyal. And another is to be useful and to have helped others. To be useful and help others. Another is to be a friend to all. A Girl Scout is courteous. A Girl Scout keeps herself pure in thought and word and deed. A Girl Scout is a friend to animals. A Girl Scout obeys orders. A Girl Scout is cheerful, thrifty <laughs> as well. So there are those 10 laws, and each of those are in detail in every manual. So this book that I have here is very useful for our troop leaders especially. They are the ones who are going to have to learn all of these wonderful skills. But at our very first meeting, it would simply be to go over what is expected of a Girl Scout. So those laws and to review the promise. Now, it's important that a Girl Scout does not uh, take the promise or truly promise until she is ready. We take that very seriously in the Girl Scouts, so you must earn it. You must prove yourself worthy of making that promise. But at the first meeting, we do talk about all of the wonderful laws that we have that allow us to become the best versions of ourselves. And of course, we end the meeting with tea. I always make sure to have a wonderful tea ready for my scouts. <laughs> Very good question. Well, we have several questions about uh, your house and the one that you're standing in front oh, of. Yes. Can you tell us about it and especially if it had electricity? Ah, well, this is also known as the Low House. And I acquired this house through my husband. Now, there's a story there, but let's just say he gifted it to me. 
So this house was truly the first headquarters of my Girl Guides and my Girl Scouts here in Savannah, Georgia. And eventually it, it does require electricity. It does acquire electricity. But the house you see before me is in Savannah, where I was born. So to have the Girl Scouts start here in my hometown was just such an honor for me. It means a lot to have all of these girls coming into my home to share in the joy of scouting. <laughs> Very good question. Uh, Ann Beauchamp would like to know if you went to college. Ah, did I go to college? Well, no, not exactly. I did go to boarding school, which I feel was a, a very wonderful opportunity for a young girl of my time. Now, boarding school, uh, students and my Girl Scouts here, how many of you would love to live at school? I wonder how many of you would. It might be... It might say a lot about how wonderful your teachers are if you say yes, <laughs> but I was expected to go to a boarding school where I would have my own dormitory. Well, of course, I shared it with my sister who was also attending, but I went to boarding schools in Virginia and I also went to New York as well. So it was during my time as a, a young woman where I was educated. And we, pro we learn similar things to what you're probably learning now. Now, I, I study different languages, particularly the French language, which I must have admit I am uh, not very good at. Uh, je parle français un peu. But my, <laughs> my mother, who can speak six languages fluently, has always um, scolded me on my French, and especially my spelling. I have to admit I am not a very good speller, but... I do enjoy writing, but the spelling is not so great. We, of course, learned mathematics as well. We learned about art. I took art lessons during this time. But you know, the, the greatest joy that I had during my schooling was meeting my friends Mary and Abby. They have been lifelong friends to me, and we met in boarding school. I, I was honestly a bit afraid that I wouldn't be able to make friends when I went to school. It's it's hard being away from your home, isn't it? Have any of you ever felt homesick before when you've gone away from home? Well, imagine being away from home for weeks and months. I was very happy to have my friends Mary and Abby at my schooling. But no, I did not attend college. I did go to those wonderful boarding schools. Very good question. Thank you. Uh, a couple of people want to know... Um what you did to attract girls to join the Girl Guides when you started, and did they wear vests? Ah, very good question. So what did I do to recruit in the beginning? Well, if anybody knows me at all, they know that I am a very sociable and persistent woman. Now, you all, you all may also know that I do have some trouble hearing, and I have always said that at least I never have to hear the word no. <laughs> And that has been my, my angle the entire time, you see. I've encouraged my friends and the, those in my social circles to help me with the Girl Scouts. And I truly do believe that the idea of scouting and all of the excitement is contagious. The young girls that I approach in the streets of Savannah, I tell everyone I possibly can about scouting. So in the very beginning, we've, of course, focused on girls in Savannah. And my good friend, Nina Pape, who was a well-known educator here in Savannah and a very progressive educator for women, she helped me along and also helped me get the word out to the Savannah girls. So it didn't take much effort, but of course you know that I also wrangled in my little nieces as well and my, my younger cousins to join the Girl Scouts as well, or of course we were Girl Guides then. So it takes a lot of socializing in the beginning, but then as we started to grow and grow, I truly believe that it was the work of the other women that were in my staff as we <laughs> began to acquire a real staff. Now, one woman is uh, Edith Johnson. She was very formative in the early years of girl guiding and girl scouting. And she, was, she knew the importance of, of good public relations. So we would try to get the word out as much as possible by using the people that we knew in our social circle. And my husband, uh, Willie, or William Lowe, had many, many connections because his family was very well known in Savannah and England. 
and truly in America. So those social connections were what I used, talking, 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 and never taking no for an answer, <laughs> and simply persistence is what really got us off the ground later. Now, as I am here in 1920, we have grown to over 80,000 Girl Scouts, and that simply floors me, I have to tell you. But I've got some interesting marketing techniques up my sleeve. Now, many of you may know that I am fascinated by aviation and airplanes, and I've convinced my good friend uh, Neville Smith <laughs> to take me on quite a number of these airplane rides. I am planning a very grand uh, activity for myself for a parade in New York. I am going to fly above the city and drop Girl Scout pamphlets from an airplane with the help <laughs> of a pilot. I can't wait for this. It's going to be exhilarating and I certainly think it will be the grandest marketing and recruiting effort that we have done yet. So you'll have to uh, t stay tuned for that. <laughs> uh. Marie Hislop wants to know if it's true that you taught your troops to tie up a burglar with eight inches of rope. <laughs> that is true. Now, I've heard from my troop leaders that the directions may need a bit more detail <laughs> in the manual itself. Well, I may even have that page ready to go. Let's see here. How to tie up a burglar. Now, that would be in my useful knots category, I'm sure. But I do have instructions on that. Now, you can see all of the wonderful knots that you can use. I'll come in a bit closer. You can see in this manual here, you learn all sorts of interesting knots. And yes, one of the activities is to learn how to tie up a burglar. Now I'm not, not finding it immediately, but it is true. With just that much cord, you can successfully tie up a burglar. But I think, uh, I think my troop leaders are right in that perhaps I should put a bit more detail into that. <laughs> but yes, it is very true. <laughs> Excellent inquiry. <laughs> uh, we have uh, a couple questions uh, about camping. Did you take the girl guides camping? And were, were you told that that's not something girls could do? Ah, so when it comes to camping, yes. We certainly went camping. That was a very large part of all of the skills that were needed as a Girl Scout. Because keep in mind that Girl Scouting while much of it is, is lots of fun and friendship and stories around the campfire, most of it is going to be learning those skills of self-sufficiency, how to take care of yourself when you don't have many resources. So we would indeed go camping. Now, in the very beginning, I would simply ask a friend of mine with a fair amount of land that was near a streetcar rail line so that we had an easy way if, to, to get out if there was an emergency of any sort. Remember, this is in the very beginning. So we would first have our camps on someone's property. And that gave us a good, a good way to introduce ourselves to the camping lifestyle. And the types of skills that we would learn would, of course, be to start a fire. Now, I always say in my manual to never go camping without a good set of matches. Now, here's a tip for you. What I do is I take a glass bottle, I put in matches in there, plenty of them, and then I cork it. So there you have a little vessel of matches that always goes with you. But other techniques we learn, of course, I have an entire section on camping. So... We always want to be careful not to start fires. Fires are very dangerous and deadly, and you don't want, uh, especially your neighbors, but, but also the poor creatures out there. We do not want to ever do damage to our beautiful natural forests. But we, there are ways that we can prevent that, and that's through good, uh, good practice through the campfire. Always make sure that your campfires are extinguished and to always leave the camp the way that you found it, if not better. So we do have an entire section on camping. Uh, we can talk about the provisions necessary for camps. We can talk about what if someone gets injured. So we know how to make a, a, an impromptu stretcher, for instance. If you get two long poles and tie handkerchiefs along the poles, you can make your own stretcher so that Let's say someone unfortunately gets injured. You then have a way to help them and carry them. We also learn the proper way to carry someone if they are injured, to always support their neck and their head, as well as uh, other ways to stay cleanly and, and have good hygiene 
uh, techniques while we are camping. All very important skills that a Girl Scout learns. Now, we would also use these occasions to learn skills like archery. If there was uh, a water nearby, we could go swimming. We also learned to shoot as well. So there are so many skills. We would even go hiking as well. But I have to say that my favorite part about camping was simply being around the fireside with my girls, telling stories. Oftentimes we would tell stories of famous women in history as well. So some good inspiration, a lot of bonding, lots of new skills, and lots of uh, confident girls learning those skills. Thank you for that question. <laughs> We have several questions about whether or not you ever had a fundraiser, for example, selling cookies. You know, as I, as I stand here today in the year 1920, I have heard tell that there are some girls who are having a bake sale. Now, in particular, I'm thinking of the Mistletoe Troop in Muskogee, Oklahoma, I believe it was. They had a very successful bake sale with a shortbread cookie recipe that we had in our magazine. So, I think that they may be on to something. I'm not sure. Do you think we should start selling more cookies? That might be an excellent fundraising model. Now, the way, <laughs> when it comes to fundraising, well, the Girl Scouts fundraiser is, is me. I have been funding the Girl Scouts for, well, its entirety. Now, as I stand here in 1920, we have made uh, funds from the s selling of our manuals, from registrations, and from selling uh, mass-produced uniforms. Now, before, we would send instructions on how to create your own uniform. But now, you can go to a department store, and if you show that you are an official registered Girl Scout, you may buy a uniform from the department store. So this is a very innovative and new technique for us. Where, whereas the girls would have to make their own uniform before. And now we can all look uh, pristine and exactly uh, unified as a Girl Scouts, because I feel that the Girl Scout uniform is a very important symbol. Now, speaking of the uniform, we have changed it over the years. In the beginning, when we were the Girl Guides, it was a blue uniform, and that would be a blue skirt and a blue top and a nice little blue tie as well. You asked about vests. We do not have vests, although perhaps that's an excellent idea. I'll have to give that some consideration. But we transitioned to our khaki uniform to be more aligned with scouts and the, way, and the more military style. Now you can see that my outfit is a troop leader's uniform. I have this wonderful Norfolk jacket made of wool. And the reason that we decided wool would be an excellent material to make our jackets out of was because it's good in all weathers. Wool is going to allow airflow in the summer, but also keep you nice and insulated and warm in the winter. And of course, this hat has a nice wide brim, so I am able to keep the sun out of my eyes. Everything is very functional when it comes to a Girl Scout uniform, but we also want to make a statement. And I truly believe that with a Girl Scout uniform, nobody knows what class you're from, whether you're a working class girl or perhaps a high society girl. Everyone is simply a Girl Scout when you are in the uniform, and that's something I take pride in. Very good question. Uh, we have someone who would like to know, uh, and this is, this is a good question. Uh, Sarah Nelson wants to know, what other progressive women of your day do you most admire and why? Other progressive women of my day that I most admire and why? Well, I have to tell you, while they may not be famous, <laughs> they are amazing women in their own right, and those are my troop leaders and my, my staff. Now, staff. Now, I mentioned uh, Edith. She was in the very beginning of Girl Scouts, and I have to admit I am not a very well-organized person. People have described me as, as a bit flighty, I, I have an idea, I'm, I've become fascinated with that idea, but how to put that idea forward? Well, that's where I needed help from my incredible Girl Scout leaders, and Edith Johnson was one of them. Uh, a young woman named Jane, who I work with now, is also very informative, and, and has, all of these women have made it possible for me to have the idea, have the spirit, have the energy, 
of, of getting the Girl Scouts uh, up and running, but I truly need those scout leaders, my staff, my secretary, and the administration of the Girl Scouts. Those were the first women that came to my mind when you asked of who I admire very much. Now, I must also say that I admire my mother very much. She was incredibly influential to me. Now, my, my mother's name, uh, she goes by Nellie, or Eleanor, and I, I feel that in my earliest years, she truly showed me what it was to be resourceful. Now, my mother, she, her family is originally from Chicago, and they were the founder, founding family of Chicago. So before Chicago was the big city that we all know, it was wilderness, and my mother's side of the family went in to settle and make peaceful relations with the Native Americans that were already there. So they had to learn skills of self-sufficiency already, many of the skills that we learn as Girl Scouts. In my earliest years, I can remember my mother, and now this was during a time called the Civil War, which I'm sure some of you are familiar with. Of course, I was only a child during this time. I, the memories that I have were simply of confusion and wondering when my father would come home. But my mother was there, and she was taking care of us with little resources, and on top of that, taking care of our neighbors as well. So she instilled in me the skills of self-sufficiency, of loyalty to one's community, and to love our neighbors, even if they did not love us back. Many of our neighbors did not like my family, in particular my mother, because she had family in the North during the Civil War. So she had family fighting for the Union. My father was fighting for the Confederacy. As a child, you can imagine that was a very confusing time for me. But for my mother to overcome the hostility of those angry neighbors and still reach out to them and help them, that is something I do remember as a child, and I feel that was foundational for me in, in growing up. So those are the women that I am very proud to know. Uh, they would like to know uh, if you taught your girls sewing, for example, sewing the tents that you would go camping in. Oh, yes. Yeah, so you talk about the skill of sewing and mending. Yes, those are all very important skills for many different reasons. Now it can simply be from mending your own clothes to creating your own tents, exactly, to sewing the fabric of your own tents. And, of course, we did discuss a little bit about how Girl Guides and Girl Scouts in the beginning would sew their own uniform. So perhaps that would be a skill that they may or may not already know. That is a skill that is expected of young women. So many of us have some of those skills. <laughs> I certainly did not. In fact, I, I have a, a funny story about sewing. When I was a child, I wanted to make clothing for the poorer children in our community. And there was, in fact, it was specifically for uh, an Italian family that lived in our community, and I knew that they didn't have very well-made clothing, and I wanted to help so badly. Now, I was a, I was a child, maybe, maybe 10 years old at this time, and so I got my cousins together and my siblings together, and we created the Helpful Hands Club. That's what we called it. And we taught ourselves to sew and made clothing for that family. Well, let's just say my club became known as the Helpless Hands Club. <laughs> they were not the most uh, fashionable clothes or the most well-constructed, but I think it was the thought that counted at that point. But sewing is a very important skill that we do learn for many, many different uses, yes. Samantha would love to know uh, if you have a favorite stuffed animal or toy from when you were a Oh, a favorite stuffed animal or toy from when I was a child. You know, I think that I truly loved the, the real animals in my life at the time. Now, I was such an animal lover. I, I remember we had a cow when I was growing up. And I recall on one very cold winter night, I was so concerned about our cow that I went promptly in the middle of the night to our guest room and took one of our beautiful guest blankets and brought it to the cow, wrapped it around the cow, what I thought was securely, and went back up to my room believing that ah, I can rest now, the cow is safe and warm. But of course, the next morning, when my father and mother saw the cow, it was perfectly fine, but the guest room blanket was trampled in the mud. <laughs> 
Now, another story about how much I love animals. I recall, well, this was at boarding school, so I was a bit older at this time, probably in my teenage years. And we saw a poor, my friends and I saw a poor sparrow that was sadly deceased. And I just couldn't stand to see this poor sparrow lying there on the ground. We had to give him a funeral. So we made a beautiful little box and put the sparrow in there. We closed the box, we decorated it, and I gave a eulogy. We even sang songs for the sparrow. <laughs> <laughs> and this was just the type of person that I have always been. I've always wanted to help, and that includes animals as well. But I, I do think I prefer uh, my, my live pets to my, to my stuffed animals, but I can certainly understand a love for either. <laughs> Very good question. Um, Katie Fitch would like to know if it's true that you got rice stuck in your ear at your wedding. <laughs> Yes, so Katie, you are correct. I did get a grain of rice stuck in my ear, which during my wedding of all days. Now, I think to tell the story of my deafness, let's start a little bit earlier. Now, in my childhood, I had chronic ear infections. I'm sure some of you have suffered from ear infections before, and you know that they are not pleasant. So as a child, I grew up with these ear infections and it did some damage to my ears over time. And so when I was 25 years old, I had read in a magazine about this experimental treatment with a chemical called silver nitrate. And well, I thought that perhaps this would cure my earaches once and for all. So I went to my doctor and I insisted that he try this experiment. Well, when he did, it damaged my ear very badly. I was sick for quite some time. And after I recovered that, not a year later, when I got married, when I was 26, my husband and I <laughs> were, were uh, exiting the chapel, and our guests were throwing celebration rice, as is tradition here in Savannah. And one of those grains of rice lodged into my other ear, my good ear. Well, the surgery to remove that grain of rice, while it successfully removed the grain of rice, it damaged my good ear. And after that, I was, well, I wasn't completely deaf, but it was a very challenging time for me. I mean, here I was, a woman who was just recently married. My husband, whose family is originally from England, and I were moving to our home in England. And I didn't know many people. It was hard to communicate with anyone, especially my husband, when I couldn't hear very well. So it was a very difficult time, and I felt honestly very sad during this time. I felt isolated from those who I loved. I felt like I couldn't communicate with my, my husband, who I was just married to. And through all my life, this has caused me some trouble. Now, it's also caused quite a bit of amusement for others. <laughs> I recall not too long ago at a banquet, well, I saw that everyone was standing up to, uh, to give someone a standing ovation. So I too, I didn't want to be rude, I stood up and started applauding wildly, hooting and hollering, and then I realized that everyone was applauding for me. So here I was giving myself a standing ovation, honestly looking like a fool, but people understood that I did have hearing issues and they understood that I had quite an exuberant personality. So oftentimes people would just simply understand that that was the way Daisy is. <laughs> now, other occasions that my hearing has gotten me in trouble, if this one was even more embarrassing. I recall that while I was at a social gathering of, now, at these social gatherings, it would often be of people of uh, high society, so one was expected to have a certain manner or decorum, and I tried my best, but sometimes they simply got too boring for me, so I suggested, why don't we all go to the pond and go fishing? Well, I convinced a few of my friends and socialites to come to the pond to go fishing, and when I cast my my rod, I felt that I got a, got a big fish. Something was tugging madly and wildly. And I said, bring the net, bring the net. Well, 
It turns out that I had hooked one of the guest's ears and I couldn't hear him yelling and screaming for help. I was terribly embarrassed about that, but of course you can say in retrospect, everyone has found that to be quite an amusing story to tell at the parties. <laughs> so while my hearing has caused me challenges, I have lived with it, I have persisted through it, and I truly feel that it's simply a challenge that I have to overcome. And in a way, it's given me some strength. I know that I have overcome it because I have been successful regardless of that hindrance. And I encourage any one of you that have what you might label as, as a hindrance, a challenge, a disability, any of those sorts, there are people like us everywhere. And we can do the same things. We can succeed just as well as everyone else. And I want you to know that. <laughs> Very good question, though. I have a couple of, of weird questions for you. Uh, and the first one is, uh, and actually a couple of people have asked this, did you actually get a piece of taffy stuck in your hair? Oh, yes, the taffy story. Yes, I was a child. <laughs> well, I was with my friend, and if, if you're not familiar with what taffy is, it's a type of confection or candy. So, we were at the taffy store, and I saw that this beautiful taffy, you pull it, it's really fascinating to watch. If you ever get a chance to go to a candy store that offers taffy pulling, I do suggest it. I know that there's one here in Savannah, and there may be for you as well. But when I, my friend saw the beautiful taffy, she thought it would be an excellent idea to braid my hair with the taffy because it was the exact same color. Well, I too thought this was a wonderful idea, so we did it indeed. And <laughs> my parents were very upset with me, especially my mother. <laughs> so you can imagine that I had this beautiful long brown hair and they did have to chop it off. So for a time, I had very short hair, which was quite unusual for a young lady. Now, as I stand here in 1920, I've noticed that some women are indeed getting those shorter haircuts, so I think I just missed the mark by about a, a few decades. <laughs> um, Emily uh, would like to know if you were part of the suffrage movement. Ah, so Emily, you want to know if I was part of the suffrage movement. And the simple answer is, well, no. You see, I had a different agenda, and I still do as a Girl Scout leader. I firmly believe that my place in, in the world is to bring girls up. Now, the suffragists out there fighting for the right to vote, their cause, they may pursue it. I, I have no issues with them pursuing that cause, but it is not my cause. I am very committed to raising these girls into confident, independent, and strong women that can go into their own careers if they like, that can go into housework if they like. But when it comes to the suffrage movement, I have not dedicated much of my time to that as so much of my time must be dedicated to the Girl Scouts. And I feel like that is where I am most useful is with Girl Scouting. Because if we continue our numbers in recruiting more and more Girl Scouts, then imagine all of those Girl Scouts becoming troop leaders and raising a whole new generation of Girl Scouts over and over again until one day that we have so many Girl Scouts that we are able to show the world that girls and women can do so much and we are capable of so much more than perhaps what others expect of us. But very good question. Uh, Melissa Bosch wants to know if there was ever a pandemic in your time. Melissa wants to know if there was ever a pandemic during my time. Yes, indeed. Now, I do recall when I was a young child that there was a case of a yellow fever that swept through Savannah. And so we had to go to the North Georgia mountains where my aunt had a home. So we did escape yellow fever from Savannah. So the way that we knew to avoid getting yellow fever, which was a very terrible disease. I, I, I'm very glad that my family made the choice to go to the mountains and essentially be isolated in the mountains. And you know, during that time, I actually have very fond memories because of course my family wanted to focus on the positivity and good things that we could do while we were away from home. 
So we would put on plays. We would uh, learn new, uh, new games for us to play. I remember playing marbles as well. And we would also enjoy going on nature walks throughout the grounds, as this was in the beautiful North Georgia mountains. So that was the first time I had any recollection of, of dealing with what you would call a pandemic or, or an, a, a sickness that swept a whole community. Now the second example is much more recent. I stand here today in 1920, and only a few years ago, we had the Spanish flu. And that was a, a very scary time. Many people were getting sick, but I believe that good hygiene is an excellent way to avoid becoming sick. Now, I always teach my girls and my Girl Scouts about cleanliness and good hygiene. So, my advice to you, wash your hands thoroughly, and I would even recommend perhaps find ways to, to make these more routine things of hygiene fun. Sing a song while you wash your hands. I also recommend, of course, bathing uh, quite often. Now, that may seem like an, an obvious thing to you, but my girls have needed to be reminded of that, especially our working class girls that are working in factories and, and through the community. So hygiene is excellent. That was very important. I even recall during the Spanish flu that folks would wear masks over their faces. So perhaps that also helps. But all of it seems, well, fairly confusing sometimes. As I stand here in 1920, I'm not sure what what we actually know about the spread of disease. I'm not myself uh, very articulate in that, but I know that, as my family did with a yellow fever uh, sickness, that moving away from that community or isolating yourself is a very good idea. Staying clean and hygienic is also a very, very good idea, but especially just as we remember in the uh, Girl Scout laws, to remain cheerful, remain helpful, and to remain positive through any of those types of times. Now I'm sure if perhaps you ever find yourself in a situation where you have to stay at home, there are many skills in our manual that you could be learning from home. So think about all of those wonderful crafts that you could be doing, perhaps those new skills that you could be learning. That would be an optimal time to learn new skills and share them with your family members. Very good question. Uh, Jessica would like to know what type of music there was in your town and what were some of your Ah, types of music. Well, I do know that in the late, let's see, the types of music I recall for as a child, well, my mother was a, a classical pianist, so she played the piano. So you might, I recall her playing Bach. She was very good at playing Bach. I do recall uh, Beethoven, Strauss, uh, Franz Liszt was also a very popular music of, of our time. Now those composers are, are long gone from us, but uh, those were the types of musics and classical pieces that I do recall my mother playing as she was a wonderful musician. Now I would also enjoy going to Broadway shows. Uh, when I was at uh, Edge Hill in New, York's, in New York, that was one of the boarding schools that I attended, and I would be able to go to uh, various musicals and Broadway shows wonderful music there, operas as well, so many. And now, as, as we are in the 20s, I've been hearing some more different types of music now. We have, it's very interesting to have, to now have uh, music that you can play on a whim. I know that growing up, I play, when I heard music, it was usually live. We would gather around, my mother would play the piano, we would sing songs together. But now, there are so many uh, technological advances with, with audio in particular that there are now machines that we can put these, uh, these, uh, this audio uh, to the world. And I'm not quite familiar with it, but it's fascinating to me. So perhaps I'll be listening to Bach on, on these new devices very soon. <laughs> uh, Michelle would like to know if you uh, ever dreamed that Girl Scouts would be as popular as it has become. Oh, well, did I ever dream that Girl Scouts would be as popular as it has become? Well, it certainly, it certainly feels like a dream in a way. You know, when I first started this out, I, I was going through a very difficult time in my life. I, my husband and I did not have a, a healthy marriage, and eventually we did decide to separate. And you can imagine that 
how heartbreaking this was. I had always thought that I was going to be a devoted wife and a loving mother, but I found out that I couldn't have my own children, and I soon learned that my husband had issues of his own that prevented us from having a healthy, positive, and loving marriage. And it was during this time that I took some time to myself to figure out what was I going to do. I had one path that I thought I was going to follow, but there was this entirely new path in front of me, one of freedom and independence. I mean, here I was, a woman with some means, some wealth and privilege. So I had the opportunity to travel the world, experience other cultures. I went to Egypt, I went to India, I even went to Canada, I've been to France and Germany, of course, England and Scotland. And it was during this time when I was trying to find a new path, some way to be useful in this world, that I met Sir Robert Baden Pole, and that I discovered Boy Scouts and Girl Guiding. And so you can imagine it was something that I had been waiting for, <laughs> for what felt like years and a long, long time. And when it landed in my lap, essentially, well, it, it doesn't surprise me that I have put everything into Girl Scouts. And I am so proud of that decision. I could have never have, dis have imagined me being a leader of an organization like this. All the time, my family has always seen me as someone who starts something that they don't finish. And here was an organization that I could dedicate my entire life to and learn all of these wonderful skills and share them with girls who, while I may have never had my own children, I see all of you, Girl Scouts, as my daughters. And I could not ask for a better life than this, even with the challenges that I've had. It has been an amazing, remarkable experience, and I have so much hope for the future of Girl Scouts. Would you <laughs> slow? Um, one question, we've got a couple of questions. Did, did your girl guides and then later girl scouts, did they give you any sort of badges that they would put on their uniform? Ah, so the topic of badges, indeed. Now, badges were, uh, they came from Boy Scouts as well and girl guides. So we were already, we had badges from the very beginning and those badges mostly had to do with um, arts and crafts was one of them. I believe camping was one of them as well, but they soon, uh, we created our own badges. And so those badges, you have to earn them. Of course, you Girl Scouts know this already, but for anyone who doesn't know, a badge is a symbol of a skill that you have learned or a project that you have completed. They can be in all sorts of things. I mean, you simply look through the chapters in this manual and you will find that there are so many badges that you can get. Now, a very special award that you may know about is called the Silver Fish. And that is a, a reward that takes quite some time to earn, but the silver fish, a Girl Scout, must win the following badges. Ambulance and first aid, clerk, cook, child nurse, dairy maid, florist, fire brigade, gymnast, interpreter, laundress, matron, musician, needlewoman, naturalist, sick nurse, pathfinder, pioneer, signaler, and swimmer. So, if you get all of those, you earn a silver fish, which is among our highest awards. So I encourage all of you to work toward those. But when it comes to the badges, I have to say that one of my favorite badges is our friendship badge, which is a badge that you can give to a friend. And perhaps that will encourage them to go into scouting. But more than that, it is a symbol of companionship and the bond you have with that special friend. So that's always been my favorite badge. Very good question. We'll do a couple more questions. All right. Uh, and one is, uh, if you, um, could you tell us a little bit about any of your siblings, if you had brothers or sisters? Oh, yes. I had quite a big family. There were six of us. So uh, there was Eleanor, who was the oldest sister. And Eleanor and I were very close. And then there, I was the second oldest daughter. And, of course, uh, then there was Alice. And Alice was my, my young sister who sadly passed away of scarlet fever and this was, this was a very trying time for my family. Um, this was actually when I, when I met my husband. It was during this time, and, and I do look upon this time as a very interesting one. I was dealing with the grief of my sister's death, dealing with my mother's grief of my sister's death and trying to be a support for her, and, of course, dealing with my own deep grief 
from my young sister, Alice. But it was also during this time that I met Willie. And despite the problems that we've had, I do look fondly back on those days in the beginning of our relationship and how it was a, a welcome, positive uh, experience in my life to have someone who gives you that giddiness and joy of, of being in love. So while it was a difficult time when Alice passed, I will always remember her. And it, I, I think about her every single day. Now, going <laughs> down the list, we also have my younger brothers, and that would be Arthur and William. So, uh, at the, my, so, so we have Eleanor, myself, Alice, William, and Arthur, and Mabel. Yes, my other sister. We'll, we'll, we'll end up with, a, with an easy one. Uh, what were some of your favorite foods to eat on a camping trip? Oh, my favorite foods to eat on a camping trip. Very good question. Now, we, with camping, especially in the beginning, I do encourage all of our, my troop leaders out there listening and my Girl Scouts, have your camping be comfortable, as comfortable as you can. Now, when I say that, bring the foods that you do enjoy. Bring delicious bacon. Bring potatoes to roast. Uh, you can bring all sorts of things to share among the Girl Scouts and cook. Now, I, I do have a, a, a fun little tip. If you insist on having baked potatoes, what you can do is, in your fire, you can bury the potato in the ashes where it's nice and insulated and hot, and as you're cooking other things over the fire, like that bacon, you can have that uh, potato baking right under it. And give it some time, perhaps an hour or so, come back, and you have a delicious, but perhaps a little ash <laughs> ashy potato. So those are the types of things that we would eat on our camping trips. Now, perhaps if we went fishing, we would have fish as well. If we were uh, in a forest that supplied um, edible berries, we could also go hunting for those edible berries, like blackberries, uh, raspberries, strawberries, blueberries. So those are the types of things we, we would bring to camping trips, ready to go, and then we would also uh, forage when it was possible. Very good question. Well, thank you all for visiting me today. I hope that I got to most of your questions. It has been such a joy to be speaking with you here today, and I. Just looking at all of you here, I am so proud to see all of these Girl Scouts from all over the country. It really warms my heart. And I want you to know that while this manual is from my time, of course, and when I wrote this manual, I don't think I could have ever imagined there being so many Girl Scouts in the United States, but this is your guide, and you can change it the way that you see fit. I understand that my girls and my Girl Scouts are the leaders. While I may have started it, it is up to you to determine the future of Girl Scouting. And I so look forward to learning what you are going to do. Thank you so much, and I can't wait to see you again in the future.